Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President and Chief Executive Officer of Red Hat, Jim Whitehurst. All right. Hello, everyone. I love that opening video. I have to say I'm so inspired, I almost don't want to speak. So, I have to say, this is really my favorite week of the year. It is every year. You know, our mission statement says that our mission is to be the catalyst in communities of customers, contributors, and partners building better technology the open source way. So you are all mentioned in our mission statement as part of what we want to do. And we try to live that every day, but most weeks, it's theoretical. We don't see you. And so what I love about this week is it's a chance to see so many familiar faces and also every year so many new faces. It really makes it human. It makes it real. And so it truly is my favorite week of the year. I am so thrilled to be here and I'm so thrilled to have so many people here. So welcome to Boston. Welcome to the Summit. If this is your, a return trip, uh, it's fabulous to see you again. If this is your first time here, I hope you'll see that this is something special and something different from the, uh, the traditional conference. So welcome. It's great to have you here in Boston. <laughs> Sorry about the heat uh, here this evening. There's apparently a glitch in the proprietary controller of the the AC system, if it were open, I'd ask you for a little help, but I'm sure we'd have it fixed by now. Unfortunately, it's not the case. Um, is Thomas awesome or what? It's fantastic to have him. And he's inspired us to open a tattoo station as well <laughs> in our booth. So if you really want to walk out with the Red Hat logo, Come to the booth. I'm sure we can take care of you. No, seriously, I think that shows the kind of passion and dedication so many people have for Red Hat and what we're doing. You know, again, this year we have record attendance way over the top. While Thomas was talking, I was backstage and I could see up top and people were still looking for seats. Hopefully we found room for everyone. We're literally exploding out of Heinz here, which is a phenomenal thing to see. Um, Promise we'll have a bigger venue uh, next year because we want you all back and we hope to continue to see this growth. I think it really is a statement about open source and the innovation we're seeing uh, that we continue to see such record growth and participation uh, in the things that we're doing together. You know, this really is our capstone event. It really is an opportunity for us to come together and share. We're excited to share what we've been up to over the last year. Um, and we're equally excited to hear about what you've been up to over the last year. So I really do hope you'll take this opportunity to reconnect with people you haven't seen in a while, but I'd also really want to make sure that you make some new connections. So please make the opportunity to make some connections to share, because that's the point of what we're trying to do. That's the power of participation. This isn't something for you to come hear what we have to say. It really is about participating in it and jointly ending up with better answers together. To kick off the summit tonight, I want to back up and, and talk about why what we are all jointly doing is so important. And when I say it's so important, it's not just important to our own organizations or to IT more broadly, but I literally mean what we are striving to accomplish in technology, and I mean we, I mean all of you, really will impact the survival or, or failure of the companies uh, with whom we work. We are in a sea change in how value is created in our economy. Right? As we are coming to the dusk of the Industrial Revolution and the dawn of truly the Information Revolution, how organizations create value is radically changing. The traditional primary way that we've created value since the 1870s and the, really the dawn of the core industrial revolution has been about making things that were either cheaper or more standardized, more efficient than things that were made before. And the way we did it is we used scale. 
And so as a recovering X strategy consultant, I can tell you almost all companies' strategies are flavors of economies of scale or a positional advantage. And it was around assets. And assets were the primary means of production. And frankly, labor, even calling labor labor, you know, is a, is a cue that it was just basically an input into um, organizations that were primarily run because of assets. But with the explosion of information technology, we've enabled the ability to, for information and analytics and knowledge to break free from their underlying physical assets. And that is causing a radical transformation in every aspect of business. I want to read you one quote very quickly, because um, I think this sums it up well, and we'll go from there. Tom Goodwin recently in TechCrunch wrote, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the world's most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest provider of real estate, of accommodations, owns no real estate. Something interesting is happening. Something interesting is happening indeed. As information rips loose from its underlying assets, we're seeing value chains come apart and value move from the owners of the assets to the people who can build augment and create new sources of information. Now, that's interesting in and of its own right, but where it gets complex is what that means is in a world where information is the primary asset, or certainly it's the source of value creation, and physical assets are becoming much more the commodity that feeds into that, that means that innovation is determining how value will be created. If you recall several years ago at Summit, I talked a lot about how the ubiquity of compute network and storage as prices came down and standardization and commoditization that open source was driving was creating a platform on which unimaginable innovation would happen. That was just three years ago that I gave that speech up here on the opening night of Summit. And it is happening so much faster than I could have ever possibly imagined. Technology is enabling change in vertical value chains, disrupting companies at a pace almost unimaginable. IT is on the front line of that change. And so I want to spend a few minutes tonight talking about what innovation, both in IT but more broadly the importance of innovation in companies in general mean for who's going to win and who's going to lose going forward. Let me give a couple examples to explain what I mean. Probably no industry I'm trying to think of the word I want to use here. No industry is iconic or most exemplifies. That was the word I was going to use. Exemplifies the industrial revolution as does the auto industry. Right? In many ways, the industrial revolution and its pace was defined by the auto industry. Um, originally, the Model T in the 1920s and early 30s defined uh, mass manufacturing in a whole new way. Henry Ford and ultimately how our economy developed, there's been no other industry that has had such a major impact on our society during the industrial era. I mean deeply, deeply. So ultimately, Henry Ford and the $5 workday created the middle class as we know it today. The ability of having ubiquitous transportation that was affordable for the middle class, i.e. the Model T, allowed for the development of the suburban kind of world in which so many of us live. So without a doubt, the auto industry in, much, uh, in many aspects defined the world we live in today. It also defined it in another aspect. Much of what we think of as the innovation and the management structures that we live in today were developed by the auto industry. So Taylorism, science of management, Alfred Sloan, so much of the early work on how organizations were founded, how decision rights were distributed, you know, how we actually orchestrate 
tens of thousands of people across multiple geographies were defined by and because of the auto industry as the first truly massive multi-divisional organizations. But recognize those organizations had a pretty different objective function than we are looking at today. These are organizations that were built to manage mass amounts of capital, relatively unskilled labor, doing relatively rote tasks. And they did a great job. We've developed management systems that run those types of organizations extraordinarily well. But let's back up and think about the auto industry today. Or I think more apt in today's world of information, let's talk about trans personal transportation. Let me give you two facts. In the United States, the average automobile is used 90 minutes a day. That's right, 90 minutes. And, depends on the study you read, and believe me, I read a bunch of them preparing for this. The average, uh, there are somewhere between five and eight parking spaces for every car in the United States. Think about that. 90 minutes a day, five to eight parking spaces. Of course, you need that many parking spaces because the car is hardly ever driven. Now, when you start thinking about the ability of information to impact that value chain, certainly making a car 5% more cheaply, which is what traditional structures were built to do, certainly has value. We'd all like to pay 5% less for our cars. But when you think about attacking the transportation problem in the context of ubiquitous broadband information and analytics, is it really about making the car 5% cheaper or is it figuring out how we take an asset that's used 10% or less of its time and a massive infrastructure to store them when they're not being driven and find ways to address that? So if you're Ford, and I'm picking one, it could be GM, pick your poison uh, of the companies, how do you think about what Uber's doing? Craig Muzilla talked about Uber before and talked about its innovation on the user front end. How do you think about what Zipcar's doing, right? These are companies that are trying to transform what manufacturing is. You know, in addition, it's not just the underlying system changing. The car itself is becoming a pretty extraordinary modern technology marvel. Even the most basic car today has over 10 million lines of source code. To put that in context, that's more than the 787. By the way, did you know that the 787 has to be rebooted every 248 days? Because there's some bug they hadn't been able to figure out, and if it goes over 256, you don't want to be on a plane that goes over. Seriously, <laughs> I kid you not, it has to be rebooted. Talking about uh, software development issue. But, e but then you get luxury cars, which once you include the nav and entertainment systems, can have over 100 million lines of source code. So the car itself is becoming a technology product. So when you think about well, what does that mean to be an auto manufacturer? First off, yeah, you got to be technically savvy. We all get this. You need to be able to develop your capability to deliver a very high-tech product with tens of millions of lines of source code. But your entire value chain is being disrupted. Right? So who you are and what you are is going to have to change. And the structures that got you here won't get you there. I love this quote, and this is the reason I mentioned Ford a couple times. This is from Mark Fields, the CEO of Ford. The car is becoming the ultimate technology product. But more importantly, we are becoming more of an information company. And I think the second piece of this is what's really insightful. He recognizes that it's not about building a technology capability. It's about the fact the whole organization and its capabilities need to change because the structure of the industry is changing around it because of information. Let me go through another uh, couple examples. I'll try to do these quickly. I love these examples, so, but I'll try to do them quickly. It's not just the auto industry. If you look at aircraft manufacturing, another classic industrial industry, not quite as old as the airline industry, more like 75 years old. But the first 75-ish years of this industry were all about making aircraft that were lighter and therefore um, cheaper to make, and cheaper to operate, and more environmental. And aircraft have done an amazing job of that, and it's 
I know it doesn't feel like it when you bought your tickets here, but air travel has become dramatically less expensive and much more environmentally efficient uh, than it was 50 years ago. And there's just been amazing innovations happening in the functional components of an aircraft. But again, technology is upending how competition is happening in the industry. The average 787 flight generates a half a terabyte of data per flight, per flight. GE's next-gen aircraft engines can measure and capture 5,000 data points on the performance of that engine per second. Now, if you think about what that means in to an, uh, an airline, an operator of that aircraft, in terms of when there might be a failure, in terms of safety, in terms of how you can manage it performance, that's huge. But if you're GE, you sell engines. But if the value's in this information, what do you do, right? And ultimately, it has completely transformed the relationship between airline and part maker to uh, an aircraft, where GE is now providing power by the hour and has to have a deep, deep, deeply embedded relationship to deeply understand their customer's business in order to be able to add the value that they strive to add from this data that they are collecting. That requires, again, not only the capability to build a, technoli a technically sophisticated product, it requires the capability to do deep, fundamental business model transformation from how the dollars flow and the whole finance function to sales and marketing and how you interact with customers and how deeply you understand your customers' businesses. Let me go through one more non-industrial example. This is one of my favorite brands in the world. For those of you who know me, you know I drink a lot of espressos a day. Um, Starbucks exploded on the scene a couple of decades ago by recognizing that the coffee shop wasn't just about coffee. It was about an extraordinary experience, right? It's a great cup of coffee, but an extraordinary experience. And it's now one of the largest food service companies in the world. But for a company like Starbucks, Continuing to maintain that position of momentum uh, requires that they continue to rethink and, and hone their, uh, their experience to continue to exceed their customers' expectations. Now, you might ask, how is coffee going to become a high-tech product? If you didn't ask, too bad, because I'm going to tell you anyway. I'm a geek. I love this stuff. So first off, I don't know if you've heard of the Clover Brewing Machine. So Starbucks is rolling out something called the Clover Brewing Machine, which is a very high-tech way to make a cup of coffee where you can control variables from the size of the grounds, when they're injected into the water, water at various temperatures, how long it's ultimately brewed, and then how it's extracted. So you can minutely, ultimately with those variables, literally create millions of different variations of coffee. And unfortunately, they don't want to have one at the Starbucks close by here. I did check. Um, they have one close to in Raleigh next to our headquarters, but they don't have one here. I'm sure you know, Boston won't be that far behind. We'll get you caught up. <laughs> but seriously, they're in the majority of Starbucks now. They make an extraordinary cup of coffee. But importantly, not only can they micromanage and segment down to millions of different varieties or, or tastes that the coffee can take, they're connected to the Internet. And while Starbucks today doesn't do it, they have the possibility of being able to store minute um, or information on customers' minute slight changes in uh, preferences for a cup of coffee. It goes beyond that. There are certain things you would expect Starbucks to do. So Starbucks was working directly with AT&T on how to make Wi -Fi, the Wi-Fi experience better, faster, more able to handle multiple people. And they have over 10 million people using their mobile applications. But they've even gone beyond those basics to things that you might think sound a little crazy, like they become very involved in wireless charging, right? They're working with one of the uh, consortia to do wireless charging um, on, for cell phones. And they're working with Apple on their iBeacon technology, which is basically a very near-field way to tell where someone is. So the promise longer term, I'm sure 
after you let them uh, or agree to let them do this. They can track when you're coming near a Starbucks. And combine that with knowing your preferences, it's possible in the not too distant future, by the time you get up to pay, your cup of coffee is already ready, exactly down to tailored to your needs. Now, the reason, God, I got somebody clapping for that, all right. Somebody else is into coffee as me, I love it. <laughs> now, I love this story really for two reasons. Um, one is the fact that they're working on most of these things with partners, right? And one of the points I'll get to later on is it's hard to innovate in a silo anymore. So whether it's AT&T on Wi-Fi or Apple on iBeacon or one of the two consortia on wireless charging, they recognize that they have to work cross boundaries to offer great solutions. And the second one is they try a lot of stuff. And you know what? Not all of it's going to work. I think that is a great example because most companies, failure is a bad thing. You don't try stuff, and you certainly don't try stuff all the way out to your customers unless you're sure it's going to work. And that hinders innovation, right? Experimentation and small failures and learning from those and continuing to iterate forward are the essence of how we're going to innovate going forward. And the fact that Starbucks gets it, I think it's a great thing to see, and it's something that's hard for traditional companies, but every company is going to learn how to experiment. They're going to have to accept failure and learn how to experiment directly with their customers. And I'll come back in a minute and talk about that. Now, I've talked about three, what I think almost anybody would say are truly iconic brands, leading companies who really kind of get it. Was that the air conditioning that I just heard come on? Seriously, I just heard that rumble? Yes. All right. Hopefully that's the air conditioning. We'll be cool by the time I'm done. Uh, but for most companies that maybe aren't quite as leading, this disruption is a huge threat. It's a huge opportunity, but it's a huge threat. Right? And so for all of us, recognizing that as assets and information pull apart, you can no longer rest on the laurels of, I got a big balance sheet, or I've always done that. Right? Um, Membership in the S&P 500 has never been more volatile. Big companies fail. Big companies fall away now because you, can't, you can no longer rest on your assets as your source of advantage. And it's getting even messier. There was a recent PwC report, the survey of CEOs. 61% said that they expected to compete in industries that they're not even in today within the next three years. Think about that. Most of that's information related. I have this information, I can now enter that segment. So value chains are colliding. Business is getting dramatically harder. And so companies have to build the systemic uh, capacity to innovate and to be agile or they're going to fail. So what does 21st century innovation look like? Right? It's kind of talked about the fact that we need to build this capability. What does it look like? Well, in a world where software is eating the world, Mark Andreessen, I'm sure, I guess I, I don't know if I have to give him attribute, but yeah, Mark Andreessen said software eats the world. And we know now that innovation is not just about the product. And we know it can't be bought. We have to build that capability. I think actually technology has a lot to say about it. We've been on the bleeding edge in many ways on how to innovate in a different way. Right, DevOps, uh, we've all been talking a lot about DevOps. I've been fascinated to watch DevOps, not just because you know, Red Hat has a strong opinion around DevOps, but I think DevOps and the principles around it, and not the technologies, but the mindset, culture, processes around it are extensible far beyond technology, more broadly into all aspects of corporations. How do you build an organization that's truly built for change, for innovation, for creativity. So thinking about our learnings around DevOps, but really importantly, our learnings of over 20 years of involvement in open source, I would propose some key things that I think we're going to see in 21st century innovation. First off, it's going to be decentralized. N now that it's no longer product innovation, Right? Innovation is not going to be centralized in one organization. Right? It's not, I'm going to throw money at R&D. It's got to cut across the company. Because so much of what we're seeing actually in innovation is innovations in how we invade, engage with our customers, how we use information to serve them better, how do we make solutions out of products 
uh, for our customers. Central planning and hierarchy do not do a good job of doing that. We need ideas bubbling up, right? We need bu ideas bubbling up, and we need the best ideas to be identified and fostered, others called, so ultimately the best ideas win. So building the capability to innovate in a decentralized way, I will argue, is going to be critical to the success of any company. Second, it's going to be more open and collaborative. It won't just be within corporate boundaries. As I talked about value chains colliding and vertical industry structures becoming horizontal, I know that sounds very consulting speak, right? But think about Uber, right? They've put themselves, inserted themselves horizontally between people who want rides and people who are providing transportation, or Airbnb between people who want a place to stay and people who are willing to uh, give them a place to stay. And in those horizontal layers, when they work their way in, their, your ability to innovate on either side of those gets to be important. And importantly for any company, recognizing that vertical structures are becoming horizontal, you'll have, in order to provide solutions, you'll have to find ways to be more open and more collaborative across your value chain. You have to learn that giving up ownership of the total idea is going to be critical in order to create the best solutions across a whole set of players that can be involved in a horizontal solution. We're also finding, and I think most of you who've been involved in open source or DevOps would agree with this, that as soon as you make open, more collaborative kind of environments for innovation to happen, that it happens in a very fast-paced and modular way, right? People experiment more. There's small failures, but that's how we build Ultimately, the few ideas that are called that become the great ideas that become the, you know, the massive businesses. I mentioned before Starbucks. I think it's just done a great job of that. They're unapologetic about trying things and trying a lot of things with their customers. And if some fail, that's okay because that's how you learn. All organizations are going to have to build that capability. Finally, openness allows for co-creation, and in particular, co-creation with users. In years past, I've talked about the importance of user-driven innovation in open source, right? To me, that is the core power of open source. And we ultimately directly talk about lack of vendor lock-in and all the other things that I think we can ultimately provide because of open source. But the real power is the fact that users are in involved in driving their own technology roadmaps. And last year, I talked a lot at the summit about the reason open source has gone from being kind of commoditizing technology to really leading innovation is because leading companies are now driving their own roadmaps in open source. And so the reason everything in big data that's kind of new and innovative, or almost everything's happening in open source, the reason almost everything we're seeing in cloud and mobile uh, are happening in open source is because users are driving innovation. And so for companies, thinking about how to co-create with users is going to be critical to their own success. Now, internally, for many of you, and I've had conversations with a number of you in the room already over the last day, um, in a DevOps context, how you work with your end users to co-create and involve them um, is a cultural mindset change that IT departments need to go through. But it extends beyond IT. It really extends to every aspect of businesses. So what's the big deal here? Why spend so much time on it? The simple reason is because it's really, really, really hard. Right? For organizations, change like this is literally a change in mindset. Right? You have to have a mindset where you're willing to cede control and accept failure. It's a change in culture. You know, Drucker said culture eats strategy for breakfast. It's a different culture. It requires building processes that were built uh, with agility and innovation in mind, not necessarily for purely for efficiency. And it's technology that's built for change. Right? It's open, modular technology that allows for rapid change. And those are radically different than the way traditional organizations are built. And again, you can think about this at a technology level and traditional technology stacks, but you can think about it all the way up to organizational structures and how organizations are wired to succeed. It is a radical change. IT's on the front line of this, but these are changes that go beyond just DevOps. I'd say just because it's a major difficult thing. It's going to impact every aspect of every company. Now, 
In years past, I think in the last two summits, I've put up a slide that shows some of the leading Web 2.0 companies and their affinity for open source and why they invest in open source and how they see it as strategic to them. I'm actually excited this year to put up a different set of companies. These are leading brands. These are leading companies. These are known as some of the best companies in the world in their respective industries. They're starting to get it too. This doesn't necessarily talk about open source software. This is their understanding that being open in how they innovate, uh, how they work with users to co-create is going to be critical to their success. Right? So the principles that we've been applying in technology for a long time, it's not just that technology is leaping out of the data center. The culture and mindset is starting to leap out of the data center to impact the very core of companies and their capabilities and ultimately their strategies and their ability to create value. So let me bring that full circle back to what we're trying to accomplish here over the next few days and what Red Hat broadly is trying to accomplish. I think it comes through when you hear from Thomas earlier or from anyone you've talked to at Red Hat. We truly are passionate about the power of participation, about getting users involved, about solving problems in an open, transparent way. And our mission statement, the first words of it are to be the catalyst in communities. Right? This is a great event to do that. Our whole mission is to catalyze communities to move forward. And over the next few days, I hope that'll come through. We're excited about technologies we've been working on, but we're really excited to hear about what you're doing and what we can do together to partner with you to drive the next generation of innovation. So specifically, you'll hear a lot about our product. So one of the core things that we work to do is to take the amazing innovation that's happening in open source and create both stable community and enterprise editions of phenomenal open source projects, right? And you'll hear a lot about specifics of what we're doing here. There's so much interesting happening here that, um, as we often talk about, it's a target-rich environment. There are so many more things we'd love to commercialize, but to do our model well, we need to focus on a few things. And these are some of those, and you'll hear a lot more about them over the next few days. But our value proposition goes deeper than just creating enterprise software from open source. We're opinionated. Because we're involved in hundreds of open source projects and are the leader or our leaders in many of those projects, we have an opportunity to see an extraordinary amount of innovation that's happening out there. But as an enterprise technology company, we also hear every day about the pain points that our customers feel. And a big part of what we're looking to do is ensure that we are bringing the right and the best open innovation, open source technologies to meet your needs. And one of the things you'll hear a lot about in tomorrow in Paul's keynote is you'll hear us talking more and more about bundles of those technologies or platforms of those technologies where we take components of these, put them together in a way to make them easily consumable in a safe, secure uh, way. And so you'll hear a lot more about that tomorrow. I don't want to steal Paul's thunder. He's sitting right in front of me giving me the evil eye. So. Uh, I won't steal his thunder tomorrow. We also hope that we can be a conduit for you to contribute. We talk about, that we're passionate about participation, and that means getting customers, contributors, and partners all contributing. One of the things that's frankly a disappointment to me is more and more as open source becomes innovative and more companies want to get involved, I hear from CIOs, hey, I went through the whole process, I got my legal department to sign off, I can now contribute, but nobody wants to listen to us. How do we get involved? How do we get involved in this open source community? I think Paul has a good expression that he says a lot, which is absolutely true, is there is no open source community. There are thousands of open source communities, and they each have their own culture, they each have their own norms, that, you know, ways of working, you know, personalities, and breaking in isn't easy. And we hope that you will see us as a way to participate in these communities to help get you going in those. You will hear over the next couple days presentations from Amadeus, Barclays, and Cisco about their contributions and participations in a set of upstream communities that ultimately become Red Hat products. 
It's a great way for them to drive their own needs upstream, drive their own agenda, but still be able to consume uh, enterprise-grade, stable, open-source technologies. You know, another example, about a year and a half ago, we bought a company called Manage IQ, and we've open-sourced that technology, and we have now the Manage IQ Foundation. And there's some great technology companies involved in that, which is great. But I was really interested to see BBVA, AutoTrader, and Booz Allen Hamilton are also upstream members of those communities. And I've had a chance to chat with them uh, about their interests, and they literally have things that they want to see on their roadmap, and they would rather directly drive them by dedicating resources and driving them into their roadmaps. I mean, those are phenomenal stories, but just the ability of these companies to be able to, to you know, be uh, able to manage their own destiny, right, drive their own technology roadmaps is extraordinary, and everyone benefits from that. Right? Certainly they benefit, frankly their competitors might benefit, but that's the power of open source. In the end, everyone uh, is better off. Finally, we hope we can be a catalyst for you as you look to change. So we've been doing open source for 20 years. We've been all in on DevOps and many of the at least culture and mindset principles are quite similar. And so as you think about the change, we can certainly talk about technology, and you'll hear a lot about our technology stack and how we can enable DevOps and OpenShift. And we talk a lot about the technology side, but we hope we can also be a partner to you. We aspire to be a partner to you as you think about the culture and mind shift and process changes, mindset and process changes that you need to make to ultimately be uh, successful uh, in that journey. We've been doing it for a long time, and as you know, if we have anything we think that's valuable to share, we absolutely do share it. All right, now, for those of you who have been at Summit's past, I'm kind of known to always give a history lesson at some point in the Summit, right? And so far, I haven't done my history lesson, but don't worry, I do have my history lesson here. So let me tell you the story, and then let me tell you why I think it's uh, particularly relevant this year and what we see in open source. So in 1783, Catherine the Great, Tsarina of Russia, took a trip to what was then called New Russia. Now, New Russia is now what we would think of as Crimea. It was recently uh, annexed. This is in 1783 it was annexed. I guess, you know, it's happened more than once. Um, <laughs> And uh, the governor of that area was a guy named Grigory Potemkin. Now, he had a little bit of complexity in that the 15 or 10 years before, he was also Catherine the Great's lover. So, you know, he had high expectations he was trying to meet here. And so she's coming to visit the region. And frankly, it was horribly poor with peasants really living in poverty. He didn't want to show that to the Tsarina. So he had fake villages built, village facades built. So when she would ride through the villages, she, she, he would, she would see these idyllic, beautiful villages that didn't really exist. And so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the term Potemkin village, right? It's come down in history as an expression to describe any false front that's used to hide a lack of content. So why do I bring up the story of Potemkin villages? Well, as open source becomes more mainstream and is considered more and more innovative, a lot of people are jumping on, right? A lot of people want to be involved in open source. And I want to be the first to say we applaud anyone being involved in open source, anyone contributing code, helping in any way possible. But we believe deeply, passionately that the power of open source is around the power of participation. It's about users. It's about the best ideas winning, and that requires broad participation. You know, Red Hat has been partic participating for 20 years in hundreds of open source projects, and the projects that we're involved in, frankly, most of them we didn't start. We got excited about them. They were started by users. We thought they were great technologies, and we've got involved, and we participate, and we're proud of what we've done. Beware of projects that are, I'll call it, open source and license only, right? Projects that have, you know, one major contributor where one contributor produces 90% of the code and calls it open source. Um, beware of projects that have governance structures that aren't free and open, where meritocracy is not allowed to, uh, to truly drive decisions in those projects. 
Open source truly has the power to accelerate innovation, to change the way software is built and consumed. But it's not about the license, it's about the participation. We're all in on the power of participation. We're open in everything we do. We truly do look to get involved and deliver projects uh, that have massive user participation. We focus on the best architectures of participation. Now, to wrap up, open source, I think, has clearly taught us all that the best ideas rarely happen from the top they generally simmer and bubble from users, right? I think a great example, you know, Docker, right? There is now a company, Docker, but Docker started off as a user in a PaaS environment, and that tool then took off, right? The best ideas generally come from users who are solving a problem. And so as we all march forward together, as software eats the world, right, you are on the vanguard of that bubbling of innovation, right? What you do and the innovation that you ultimately drive for your organizations will determine whether you're a disruptor or a disruptee. Right? Our decisions will define broadly you know, the success and failure of industry structures over the next few years. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of pressure, so you better decide the right technologies. But <laughs> Luckily, you're not in this alone, right? Yeah, I think it's important to recognize, and, and we stand here as well, we're not here telling you how technology is going to unfold because no organization can predict the future of technology. But I am convinced a coalition of us can build it. We will build it. Over the next few days, I hope you do make connections. I hope you help build the coalition that's going to define the next generation of technology. Together, we truly can be the disruptors, and that's what the summit's about. It's a chance for us to get together, to learn from each other, and help jointly define uh, our ultimate technology roadmaps in our futures. So I hope you really find the summit uh, to be um, a place where you meet people. I hope you find it useful and exciting. I hope you make some new connections. So welcome to Boston. I'm thrilled to kick off the summit. So welcome, and I look forward to seeing you over the next few days. Thank you.